Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you believe it? Today is the 21st day of our liver imaging course. And it's a special day because we have one of our great colleagues, he's intervention intervention radiologist, who is not diagnostic radiologist like the majority of us. And he's a great friend and colleague from MD Anderson, Dr. Armin Mavash. Dr. Armin Mavash is a professor in the Department of Intervention Radiology at the Division of Diagnostic Imaging in the University of Texas, MD Anderson Cancer Center. He uh, joined MD Anderson in 2006 in the Department of Intervention Radiology, and he was uh, subsequently promoted to associate professor, then recently to a uh, uh, professor, Dr. Uh, Marvash, uh, uh, main area of interest is liver intervention procedures with emphasis on the Y90, radio embolization. And, and actually he is our expert in radio embolization. He does a lot of those. He, Dr. Uh, Marvash Mar is known to be an international world renowned intervention radiologist. Uh, many visiting professorships, uh, many research and educational papers and many lectures even locally at our MD Anderson. So with, with that, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, ask Dr. Uh, Mavash to start. And we were very excited you're here, Dr. Mavash. We have people here, audience from all over the world, looking forward to listening to, to you about liver-directed therapy for HACC. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carla. Thank you for inviting me. And I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night to everyone wherever you are in the world. So I hope uh, this will be educational and informative for everyone that's out there. So uh, just my disclosures. So just a quick outline, I wanna talk about the essentially two basic categories of liver-directed therapy, ablation, which has its own subcategories, as well as transarterial therapies, which has its own subcategories, we'll go through them. So just very one brief slide about hepatocellular carcinoma it is currently the third leading cause of death in the world. And there's over 800,000 deaths um, in the United States right now. It's the fifth leading cause of death. The incidence of NASH, uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, has increased significantly in the United States over the last 20 years. And now it is the second leading cause of cirrhosis um, in the U.S. And that's even though with, there are therapies and vaccines for hepatitis B and C, uh, NASH is increasing. And so there's really only two categories of therapy, essentially curative therapy, which includes resection, transplantation, and ablation, which we'll talk about. And then the palliative therapies, which are also, also available um, for patients that are not eligible for the curative resection or transplant or ablation. So just very briefly, I'm just going to use the NCCN guidelines in, for the U.S. These are the U.S. guidelines for patients that have hepatocellular carcinoma. And if they are resectable or transplantable, then clearly they would go to one of those, those arms. They would either get resection if they have adequate liver remnant without significant portal hypertension and deemed by the local surgeon to be eligible. But if they are not, if they have decreased liver function and they are trans, uh, eligible for transplant, then that would be the, the, the next option. And then after they are not eligible for those two, then they would go to local regional therapy and ablation for small tumors is the primary uh, um, is the primary choice for those patients. So this is again for transplant patients as you can see you get transplanted if not then other local regional therapies. There are other guidelines. There's the BCLC guideline which uh, much of the world uses. Um, we, t we, also, we also use it but not uh, strictly but it divides patients into early stage on the left side where you see single less than two centimeter HCC. Those generally patients can be resected um, or ablated. Um, and then obviously early stage patients with less than three lesions, less than three centimeters can also go for um, ablation and transplantation and or resection. And then as we go farther along the guidelines to the right, obviously then you go to the intermediate stages and taste is their, is their standard for those patients. Those are multi, generally patients with multinodular HCC with a preserved performance status. And then as you get to advanced stage with portal vein invasion, metastatic disease, and decreased performance status, then at the time of this, serafinib was the first line, but now there are technically 
other first line therapies um, and we can talk about those later. I think there was a discussion about them last week. Um, Serafinum, Lembatinib, and then Atizo Bevacizumab is now going to become the first line um, with the recent randomized study that was completed. So this is our algorithm. It's incredibly busy. I'm sorry this is our slide, but this is how we look at it. And so if you look at the less than th three lesions, less than three centimeters, we still prefer ablation because it is a curative therapy and that, that would be the preferred option if you are not a surgical candidate. And then we don't exclude then maybe other local regional therapies. So taste, taste with ablation, radioobilization, and then other uh, radiation therapy as well. And then as you go down the algorithm and you have more and more lesions, we still will uh, attempt taste if feasible. And then otherwise, um, as we go down, taste uh, leads to large tumors tend to get radioembolization or radiation therapy, and multifocal disease tends to get radioembolization with or without systemic therapy, depending on the uh, discussion at tumor board. Um, and any tumor with branch portal vein thrombosis, uh, systemic therapy with radioembolization is also considered. So we review this every two years, and actually right now it's under review, but this is our algorithm. You can Google it, it's available. So just really briefly, surgical resection is the preferred method. So liver-only disease without vascular invasion, prefer, prefer, preserved liver function without portal hypertension, and obviously their survivals um, are better than all other modalities if you can get resection. There is some perioperative mortality, and then obviously, Unfortunately, when you do a resection, there is a significant risk of recurrence, and those in, in the data that's uh, that's available, you generally have between 50 and 70 percent recurrence rates at four years. So transplantation obviously is also an option, except there's except there is obviously a wait time for transplantation. In our region, it's usually at least one year, um, and so. Uh, if you are eligible for transplant, in general, we will do a liver-directed therapy to keep you on the transplant list. But clearly, the Milan criteria is what's currently being used without vascular invasion, no metastases, and um, uh, there usually is some bridging therapy to get people to transplant due to the lag time between uh, your placement on the transplant list and the time you're going to get the transplant in, the, in Houston or in this region. And now it's been kind of equilibrated in the United States, it's at least about a year for you to get your transplant. So let's just go quickly to ablative therapy. So the oldest ablative therapy that's been around was percutaneous ethanol ablation. It's basically pure ethanol that is uh, injected through a needle, usually under ultrasound and CT guidance. It's been around for a very long time and it's still used in certain, sequ in certain uh, um, instances, but there are studies comparing radio frequency ablation to ethanol ablation and shows benefit in terms of local tumor control and survival once you have for rate of frequency ablation. So ethanol in, in the U.S. Is generally has, has decreased its use. RFA and microwave is a newer technology, um, have been used extensively. We use both of them in our practice. Um, most of the randomized studies, actually all the randomized studies, I'm sorry, were done with RFA, but now microwave is kind of gaining acceptance because of the ability to do larger uh, ablations. Um, and without the compl complications of heat, heat sink effect, essentially if you're right next to a vessel uh, over three millimeters, then the margin of that ablation is very difficult to get with radio frequency ablation. Irreversible elect electroporation is also available. It's a definitely much newer technology and uh, it does require general anesthesia due to the uh, cause, cause, basically because of the alternating current causing muscle twitching. Um, it, we use it very rarely, but we do, do have it available in our practice. And cryoablation is not used a lot in HCC, but it's still available, mostly used in renal and soft tissue tumors. So let's just talk a little bit about RFA, what's out there in the data. There are multiple randomized studies. Uh, this is, these are from 2006 and 2010, randomizing uh, hepatectomy versus ablation for small HCC. And then there was another study in 2010 that actually patients within Milan criteria. So a little bit different patient population, but the two results are a little bit different. The first result, the older result, basically showed similar overall survival and disease-free survival for the small HCC. So these are very small. These are two centimeters or smaller. Um, the larger, the, two, the group with the larger tumors, up to five centimeters, the issues were that you had certain, you, you 
the survival benefit obviously was not there, but also recurrence-free survival, because the problem is, is that uh, ablating a five centimeter tumor is incredibly difficult using the technology that we have available even today. So um, if you look, there is an actual, here, let me go to the next slide. So this, is a, this is a meta-analysis of all the data that's available. And if you can see, tumors less than three centimeters you look at the data that's very close between resection and RFA in terms of their overall survival. Um, but as you get above three centimeters, and that still is currently in the guidelines above three centimeters, your risk of recurrence is higher. Um, you have to recognize that all these people are gonna likely have some form of recurrence if they live long enough because they have underlying liver disease. And so this is just a quick case. I'm gonna show a patient with, actually the patient had three lesions, there's one lesion here and one lesion here, and there was another lesion in the left lobe that was also ablated. So this patient got an ablation, and unfortunately at the first follow-up, there was a small area of enhancement at the margin of the ablation cavity. So it was followed for one more cycle to make sure that this was a real finding, and it was. So luckily, the, and the other lesion was completely ablated, so the patient came back for another ablation session and now this is the post ablation this is the mr you can see the cavity is a little bit bigger and it encompasses the totality of the original lesion so the one good thing with ablation is if you get an incomplete ablation uh, you do have the opportunity to go back and re-ablate and this is just the ct of the same patient as you can see the cavity is much bigger than and it, and it fully encompasses the entirety of the lesion so ablation is is clearly the preferred method for small hcc because it is a curative therapy the key is that you have to maintain a margin, ideally, at least five millimeters, because there is microscopic disease the margins of the lesions that you can see based on imaging. Um, and so preferably, if you can get up to one centimeter, then obviously uh, better local, local recurrence uh, control, tumor, local tumor control. So you can also combine therapies. This is an interesting case because the patient had tumor on the portal vein, and the concern was that the uh, ablation would be potentially be insignificant, not significant enough on the tumor that's on the portal vein due to heat sink or cooling. So this is just the pre-procedure imaging and you see it's about an almost 2.7 centimeter tumor, but it sits on the portal vein. And so on, this is an intra-arterial CT. The patient's on the, on the gantry, on the table, ready for uh, a transarterial procedure as well as an ablation, ablative procedure. And this is the actual CT with the catheter and the hepatic artery. <coughs> You can see the tumor obviously light up very extensively due to the intraarterial injection, but it allows for a very clear delineation of the tumor as well as to perform a transarterial procedure at the same time. So, I'm sorry, let me get this to work. So if you look, the ablation was performed here. <coughs> the current concerns were about the margin of the tumor, so there was also a chemobilization done at the same time. Now, whether you do the embolization first or the ablation first is up to debate. Some people prefer to do one, some people prefer to do the other. I don't think there's any absolute consensus of one versus the other. In this case, the ablation was done first and the embolization was done afterward. And so this is a patient two months and six months post. You're gonna have a larger cavity on the initial follow-up with some per perfusion abnormalities, the necrosis in the territory of the ablation and embolization, because there's some post-embolization changes here, but at six months, you can see there is uh, no recurrence on the vein itself, and there is no enhancing tumor left at the follow-up imaging. So in general, what is the rationale for any transarterial therapy? So the normal liver has obtained 75% of its blood flow from the portal vein and 25% of its flow from the hepatic artery. But hepatic neoplasms, as long as they are above three millimeters, generally derive most, if not all, of their supply from the hepatic artery. And most tumors, including HCC, but also metastatic disease, have a much greater vascular density within the tumor than the normal liver. So what are the indications for any transarterial therapy? The presence of so these are patients that are not surgical candidates and also patients not amenable to an ablative therapy. Uh, they can be used as bridge to transplant or downstaging for resection. That's also available and then palliative treatment for liver only or liver dominant disease. And that, that varies from location to location and how people use this therapy. So these are the four categories of transarterial therapies. So TAE bland embolization, transarterial embolization, it's the oldest therapy that's been around. It's 
basically embolization of any feeding vessel going to the tumor with any different type of device. And I can show in the next slide what they are. Then there's TACE, which is the conventional TACE, which has been around since the early 80s, originally uh, described in the Japanese literature. Basically, there's an embolization of the arteries using a chemotherapeutic agent with or without um, uh, lipidol, which is a poppy seed oil, and, uh, using, and with or without an embolic agent at the end. And then there's the newer kind of in the mid-2000s called drug-eluting bead taste, which is embolization as well as chemotherapy, but it's a drug-eluting bead in the mid-2000s. There was a study, which I'll show, which showed uh, some benefit of this therapy. And then radioactive microspheres is uh, CERT or radioembolization, um, selective internal radiation therapy. Is obviously, it's not embolic. It's very, it's microembolic. You're not trying to stop all the blood flow because you've maintained the arterial flow to the tumor, but you are having some um, uh, microembolic effect with the, with the small particles in the tumor itself. Emitting radiation is like a small sphere of cloud of radiation to the tumors. So what in general, patient selection is very similar for all these therapies. Ideally, ECOG status of zero or one, but up to two, depending on kind of circumstances. They should obviously have a life expectancy of at least three months to get any benefit. Total bilirubin less than two milligrams per deciliter. And if you're doing a very selective embolization up to three, some people have described even higher, but you have to be very careful because you do not uh, injure any of the surrounding parenchyma. AST, ALT, usually less than five times upper limits normal and generally less than 70% tumor volume, realistically less than 50% tumor volume in most practical aspects. If you're getting above 50% tumor burden, your overall survival generally is pretty short. Um, obviously, adequate liver function with a child P score of B7 or less, and then adequate renal function free to angiography. So just very briefly, what's transarterial embolization is basically a permanent or temporary occlusion of the feeding vessels with some agent. So most currently, most people use particles, they vary from 40 microns, which is the smallest particle that's available, um, up to even over 900 microns. Gel foam has also been used as an embolic agent. It's a temporary agent. It basically can be embolic anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of weeks at most. Um, obviously, coils can be used, glue, and glue as well. But in general, most embolizations for HCC have been done with particles. Um, this is a study out of Sloan. They are kind of the world's leader at doing bland embolization for HCC. That's kind of been their paradigm for many, many years, which they look, and this is their study from several years ago, looking retrospectively at their patient cohort. They tend to do their bland embolization with small particles, 40 to 120 microns, and uh, looking at their median survival of 21 months. It actually matches, and I'll show the literature for other taste data from other centers. But obviously, you have to subcategorize them into different categories of early versus uh, intermediate or advanced stage. Obviously, with 75 patients with PBT, those are the advanced stage patients. Their overall survival was very reasonable. And obviously, without PBT or extrapatic disease, your survival is going to be similar to the data in the taste literature. So there's some risk of death after any transarterial therapy. Um, there's uh, some complications with very small particles in terms of shunting, which people need to be very careful about. So what is chemoembolization? So it's a conventional oily, it's the conventional chemoembolization that people have described since the early 80s. It's basically a oily uh, mixture of a chemotherapeutic agent with the uh, embolic agent, which is the lipidol, which is iodinated poppy seed oil. And you're essentially injecting this therapy after it's been mixed in a syringe. Um, using this combination of ischemia and the chemotherapy effect. Now, the chemotherapy effect is a questionable benefit in terms of the true mechanism of chemotherapy because the therapy only is in the tumors for about a one to two hours using conventional taste. Um, the drugs that are used vary depending on where you are. Historically, in the United States, we use three drugs when I was training, but now it's single drug. Most people are using doxorubicin, but other people are using doxorubicin and other medicines as well. Um, there is unfortunately no standard protocol, and that's always been the difficulty. Even these two randomized trials, which were both published in 2002, used two different therapies and two different methods by which to uh, do the procedure. I'll just show very briefly. This is a study from the European groups uh, that compared arterial embolization versus chemoembolization versus a symptomatic treatment back in 2002. 
And they basically randomized patients to all three arms, small numbers, 40, 37, 35, essentially use doxorubicin with lapidol and gel foam versus gel foam versus best supportive care. And basically you can see the two arms separated out, the control arm and the key mobilization arm. There actually is a bland embolization arm that is not in this diagram, which had it had they progressed may have actually showed also showed benefit. So, um, but essentially this study, and then this following study, which was done in Asia, this was actually both published at the same time uh, basically doing, using a different regimen, using cisplatin with a pyval and gel foam. So a slightly different chemotherapeutic agent showed the, the more advanced disease in this group, but the overall survival versus the control group, which was best supportive care, was significantly better. And basically these two studies kind of cemented uh, chemobilization in the algorithm for treatment of HCC. So this is a quick picture of a conventional taste. You can see there's a solitary lesion up here in the dome. This is uh, the CT with the intraarterial. Uh, you can see the about two centimeter enhancing lesion. And this is the in-room um, imaging using cone beam CT. And you can see the enhancing tumor here. Essentially, you're gonna take your microcatheter, get as selective as possible, as distal in the vessel as possible, inject your, your mixture of a thiodol and a chemotherapeutic agent followed by an embolic agent. And when you finish, you see this dense accumulation of uh, of the ethidol in the tumor, and post-imaging follow-up shows nice necrosis with a very thin rim of enhancement. Um, we don't do a whole lot of conventional taste anymore because of the advent of drug eluting beads, which I'll talk to you about next. So what is drug eluting bead dead taste? So it was first developed early in the early 2000s. There are multiple devices. Actually, there are, I think, four devices in the U.S. presently, LC beads, um, DC, they're named different things depending on if you're in the United States or not, because in the US, these beads are not approved for drug elution. So if you use them in the United States, they're off label use of the device. Outside the United States, uh, people, the rules tend to be a little bit less strict, and so they can be used um, for, uh, for, you know, as a drug eluting device. Um, the, in the U.S., if you want to use the device in a clinical trial, you must get an investigational device exemption. In the two most common uses, DEP, DOCS, doxorubicin, which is the red vial, um, is used generally for HCC, and people have used arenatecan, so arenatecan beads for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, as well as H, sorry, as metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, the one kind of unique thing about these, these are very uh, much more precisely uh, measured in size, and obviously you know exactly how much agent you gave because they're uh, essentially soaked up in the beads like a sponge. So what are the differences between conventional taste and deb taste? Very this is, an, this is a study looking at the drug levels, inter, intraserum drug levels of doxorubicin post conventional taste. You can see you get a very high spike, and then within about an hour you come down and you basically have are washing out the doxorubicin from the site of your injection. While dead taste, on the other hand, has a very slow, long elution of the doxorubicin. In reality, in animal studies, there's doxorubicin it's in there two and three weeks after it's being eluded for many, many weeks. It only, it only um, eludes for about 600 microns from the bead itself. So it's not, um, it's not going everywhere. So you have to, everything has to be within 600 microns of the tumor cells for you to elude the, the drug. But most of the actual, likely most of the actual efficacy is the uh, vesicant effect of the doxorubicin when you're injecting it, as well as the embolic effect. So this was the study in, that was done in Europe that basically compared doxorubicin loaded beads to conventional tastes uh, published in 2010. And basically they used different sized doxorubicin beads versus doxorubicin, lipidol, and embolic particles. And what they showed was that there was actually, um, in terms of superiority, it was not superior. The p-value was not superior. However, there were significantly less systemic effects from the doxorubicin loaded beads. And so at this point, due to the lower systemic side effects, a lot of people shifted to doxorubicin uh, eluding beads, especially in the United States and, and in Europe. The problem is that the beads are much more expensive than the original Lapidol carrier that was used in conventional taste. So in the US and Europe, there was a change, but there's now a switch back actually. So 
So there's been other studies that go back and forth, but this is a multi-center study that was published several years ago comparing conventional depth taste, conventional taste to depth taste using smallish particles, 100 to 300 microns versus um, epirubicin as the drug, but the drug itself I think is not as important as the, me the method by which it was used, but essentially what you look at is there's time to progression in mo both arms was similar to nine, nine months, and the over sur overall survival in both arms were nine months. So if so in the current uh, kind of schema, there's a, there has been a shift in patients to go back to conventional taste. There are some places in the U.S. that always did conventional taste and never sh shifted. We do both uh, in our practice. Uh, and so it just really depends on, as you can see, the efficacy is very similar. So it depends on the uh, user and how they choose, what they use, choose to use. Um, there is... So this, there was a randomized study done at Memorial Sloan Kettering several years ago that was trying to compare doxorubicin eluding beads to bland embolization, just bland microspheres. They're the group that does a lot of bland embolization. And their study um, shows basically no significant benefit of the drug eluding beads versus the um, drug eluding beads versus bland, bland particles. Now, there's a lot of methodological issues with this study. I don't want to get into the details, but um, when you go to the FDA and you want to do a study, they still point to this study saying that, well, there's no benefit of drug eluting beads over bland embolization. Um, but the study, if you have to look in the details, there are, some, there are some issues with the methodology which they use for the study, but this is still the study that stands when you compare bland embolization to uh, drug eluting bead team embolization. What are the general side effects of any embolic procedure? So post embolization syndrome, Almost everybody, 75, 80% of patients can get pain. They can just get nausea and vomiting associated with the pain and low grade fevers. And they always get transient elevation of their LFTs. Um, liver abscess, incredibly rare. Liver failure, incredibly rare in, in selected patients. And vascular entry, also very rare. Generally, we will embolize smaller tumors in our practice. And maybe they'll be hospitalized for one or two days. When you were doing larger, low bar embolization, they would be, they would be hospitalized two, three, four days, up to five days due to the significant volume of embolization. We have changed our practice. And if you have low bar disease requiring multifocal, multifocal disease requiring uh, multiple embolization, we tend to do radio embolization in our practice. So there is an additional side effect, obviously, with chemotherapy, and there's some lower systemic effects with depth taste. One important thing is that there is violation of the ampule in these patients. They're incredibly high risk for abscess formation and uh, you can give them pre and post procedure antibiotics to reduce their risk. What is radioembolization? We call the other word is uh, uh, selected internal radiation therapy. So it's a transarterial therapy of a, of a Y90 microsphere via catheter. Same principle, except a little bit more complex. The spheres are actually about 25 to 35 microns, and they are trapped in the distal arterioles due to their size. Uh, they are, uh, the beta emissions from the Y90 microspheres are basically capable of delivering lethal doses with, within a territory of up to five millimeters. It does, they do migrate up to 10, 11 millimeters, but in reality, most of the energy is deposited in the first five millimeters around the spheres. There are two commercially available Y90 products in the U.S. and worldwide. Um, there are SirSphere's made by a company, uh, Sirtex and Therospheres, which was made initially by uh, BTG, which, uh, but now BTG has been bought by Boston Scientific, so Boston Scientific owns this product. There's actually a third radioactive microsphere called Homium Microspheres. They're called Aquarium Spheres. They're developed at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, and that is also available in, the, in Europe, but not available in the United States. So they, the, there is a third device, but not available in the U.S. at present. So looking at outcomes, this is a slightly older paper from a group at Northwestern looking at just single cohort of patients with Y90 glass microspheres. What I want to show you is the median survival of these of BCLC A, B, and C patients. It varies depending obviously on the stage of your disease. But if you look at this, this is the glass microspheres. And then you compare this to the group out of Spain looking at the European uh, uh, cohort using the resin microspheres. If you look at BCLC A, B, and C patients, the numbers are almost identical. So there's not honestly a big difference in the efficacy of the two devices. They're slightly different in the way that they are just 
delivered and the way that um, the devices are handled, but in general, the efficacy of both devices are very, very similar. Um, what are the general adverse events of radioembolization? So in the US, it's generally an outpatient procedure. I know talking to colleagues in Europe, in Europe, it's mostly an inpatient procedure, I think mostly due to reimbursement issues. Uh, but there is some post-embolization syndrome in about 5% of patients because it is only microembolic. So they tend not to get the uh, post-embolization syndrome. However, most patients will get some fatigue depending on the volume of liver that is being embolized. So the, the radiation itself is causing fatigue. So uh, it's usually self-limiting, usually for a week or two, depending on your overall uh, performance status. People generally are going to work after this procedure. They're not hospitalized and generally not taking medicine. They just feel a little bit more fatigued than their normal everyday self. Um, Radiation-induced ulcer, duodenal ulcer, gastric ulcer, was really an issue years ago, but in, in recent uh, in recent incident studies, it's really on the order of one to two percent. In our practice, we have do about 150 190 cases a year. We have not had an ulcer in more than five or six years. So if you do very detailed imaging, I think the risk of radiation induced injury is very very low now with a modern era and modern imaging. Radiation induced liver disease is very important. We're understanding because you can put the patient in liver failure. It, historically, it's been one to two percent, and I think we can improve that, make it below one percent using advanced dos dosimetric techniques. Um, radiation cholecystitis and pneumonitis are very, very rare. So I'm just going to show a quick case of a patient that actually got both radioembolization and bland embolization at the first setting. This a patient had been resected previously and had a recurrence of this almost seven centimeter caudate lesion. He was not eligible for resection because he'd already been resection, resected and the surgeons were not uh, did not want to take him to a resection. He actually had multifocal disease. I can't, you can see them very clearly. He actually has several small enhancing lesions that end up being HCC. Um, so therefore he was not a candidate for resection. So quickly in room cone beam CT, I think it's very important for uh, the practice to know that this exists. It's basically a three-dimensional image in the room. What's interesting is that you can see part of this tumor is not perfused by the hepatic artery. And we go and look and we find that a portion of this tumor is actually perfused by the right phrenic artery. So this is the right phrenic angiogram and he has a branch here from the right phrenic that actually is perfusing the tumor here. So now the problem is you you can do Y90 from extra hepatic vessels, but it has its own increased risk. And this is a case from many years ago. And so at that time, I chose to do a combination of Y90 and bland embolization. Just very quick, this is the angiogram of the right phrenic artery. And what you can see is there is a single feeding vessel to this area of tumor in the right, in the caudate branch. So after we did the actual treatment, I'm not going to go into the details of the treatment, but after we did the treatment, you can see that in the tumor itself, there are areas of air in contrast, which correspond to the areas perfused by the right phrenic artery. And then if you do post-procedure Y90 imaging, which we do on everybody, you can actually quantify and localize where the Y90 is. So you can see the Y90 in this portion of the tumor. And then the area that doesn't have Y90 is the area that got bland embolization. And then his other tumors intrahepatically also received Y90. And so this is him two months, just really briefly. So he's got some residual areas of nodular enhancement, and these were called residual disease at the time. Um, but we said, follow him and see what happens. So this is at six months. And over time, both in the area of radioembolization and the area of bland embolization, they're decreasing, not completely gone, but decreasing. And this is him at one year. And he still had a tiny area of residual enhancement here at the one year mark, but he had actually been downstaged and became eligible for transplant. And he was transplanted at 18 months. And on transplant, he had complete pathologic necrosis. So you can get complete pathologic necrosis with bland embolization or radioembolization. It's possible. There's data on both. Um, just another case of radioembolization, a patient with um, intraportal tumor or portal vein tumor thrombus. Um, just a brief history is a gentleman has a baseline MRI showing this is his portal vein tumor thrombus here. 
extending into the portal vein on the right portal vein here. And he actually has an indwelling biliary stent. And on geography, just you can see that there are some areas of hypervascular tumor, which doesn't show the level of detail that you need to do the procedure that way. That's why cone beam CT is incredibly important in planning these procedures. And then you can see very clearly the tumor itself in the in finding the arterial supply to the tumor, incredibly important for your treatment planning. So we do post-administration imaging after you give the Y90 to see, did the Y90 end up getting to the site that you wanted? And here we are, you have a very high, uh, essentially activity or dose of Y90 in the areas of known tumor. And this is just from, a, I'll talk about Y90 tomorrow uh, again, but this is just an interesting, this is kind of the future of Y90, is that you, you figure out what dose the normal liver received and the dose the tumor received. This is a dose volume histogram in radiation oncology. It's used obviously for all therapies in Y90. It's evolving as a mean by which to show what dose the tumor receives and what dose the normal liver receives. And so this is him at three months. This is his arterial phase CT. There is some perfusion abnormality, obviously because of the treatment and the PVT, and you can see some decreased enhancement. This is the portal venous, uh, and you can see that there's a lot of significantly decreased enhancement. And this is him at six months, nine months, 12 months, and 14 months. At this point, he actually had an area of recurrence at the site where the biliary stent was. So he got resected and at, at, at 16 months at resection, there was complete pathologic necrosis. So you can, again, uh, achieve complete, complete path necrosis even in patients with PBT. So this is a final case I wanted to show. It's very interesting. It's a patient who got every single IR therapy that we could do. The patient got drug eluting bead taste and ablation and Y90 and percutaneous ethanol abl uh, ablation in a single patient over about a three and a half year period. So just very briefly, the patient started with multifocal um, HCC. There's a solitary lesion here. There is actually a small lesion in the left lobe right here, which is very tiny, and these two larger lesions in the right lobe, segment 656. Six. So initially we chose to go try to do chemoembolization for our depth taste. So we used a newer bead that was available at the time. It's called the Luby beads, which are still available. They're much more radio opaque. But this is the in-room intraarterial CT. You see one tumor here, the arterial supply, second tumor, third tumor. This is just an interesting image of the post, this is post after they administered the beads. The beads are incredibly radio opaque. Um, and you can see without any contrast, you can actually see the beads in the vessels and you see incredible density of the beads in the tumor itself. So she ended up getting another, she get it, and get it, did not get a complete response. The issues with bigger tumors is generally you have to do treat patients multiple times for bigger, bigger tumors. But this is her, uh, conventional post-procedure imaging, and we get, did get a reasonable response in the areas that we treated. The upper lesion in the right lobe was not treated, was, the vessels were too small, and we could not get enough of the drug eluting beads into the tumor. So therefore, she went for microwave ablation of that tumor. And so therefore, here she is post-microwave ablation. So you can see you have complete ablation here with some unfortunately areas of recurrence and growing lesions in the left lobe. So at that point, she did get Y90 to the right liver with a plan to do some selective treatments to the left lobe. And so in this case, we actually did percutaneous ethanol ablation and Y90 in a single treatment session. So we did ethanol ablation to this lesion right here. You can see, and then we did a Y90 to this lesion that's kind of exophytic abutting the hepatic artery. And you can actually see on the post-administration imaging the density of the glass microspheres that were used. And so this is her post all these different therapies about three and a half years later. So address the ablation site, the, the uh, Y90 site was left and right, and the original drug eluting bead location. So she's still alive. This is four years after she's on systemic therapy. So the problem is, even if you get a complete response in, say, an ablative candidate, the patients that do are eligible for ablation, they have a very highly likelihood of recurrence. So you have to make sure you can go back and retreat these patients again in the future. And so therefore, using kind of a minimally invasive technique, to try to spare the liver that you can and treat the liver that you um, 
that needs treatment allows you to go back and retreat patients as needed. Um, kind of the last little two slides. So the, what is the you know difference between the three different transitory therapies? Obviously, bland, key mobilization, CERT. Really, realistically, the comparison of these therapies are not possible. There is one randomized study comparing CERT to Y90, and I'll describe that tomorrow. Um, it is a single center, unfortunately, study, so therefore that it, it, it is not multi-center. It kind of people kind of question the results, but it's, it is a respected center in the U.S. So retrospective uncontrolled series are not reliable. You cannot do a single center retrospective study and say that you know this therapy is better than the other because there's a lot of selection bias that goes along, essentially. So obviously the decision of therapy is up to each site. All the therapies are effective and the local expertise at each site will direct the treatment type. And you can obviously get multiple, multiple lines of therapy and you likely will require it because you have underlying liver disease. And so essentially, curative ablation is always the preferred non-surgical treatment because it is a curative technique. Um, the problem with ablation is, is unfortunately currently really limited to three slightly, maybe slightly larger than three centimeter tumors. Obviously the location must be also amenable not central, not near a large vessel, not near bile ducts, because you can get biliary injury. Taste, which was investigated in the early 2000s, and it had become, has become essentially the primary accepted therapy for non-surgical, non-ablatable HCC due to the two randomized studies I described earlier. Now, some people would argue that the, the control arm in those studies was no treatment, and so there are other therapies available now that you know you can compare. That's why Y90 is kind of emerging as its role as a role in liver directed therapy. Again, I think the multidisciplinary conference is incredibly important because we discuss all these cases in our conference and essentially decide what to do at that time. Um, most patients will recur, have recurrence, as you can see, even in the surgical literature, even with complete surgical recession, they will recur and they will require further treatment. So multiple treatments. Uh, essentially are almost always required. Boy, thank you to everybody. Um, I'm not sure if I can receive questions. Um, anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mavaj. This was a great lecture. Uh, it's particularly important for diagnostic uh, radiologists to also uh, uh, be educated about and be knowledgeable about these therapies and the, uh, the good radiology is not good really without understanding in depth about these interventions so thank you very much this was very informative and comprehensive